good evening to you all thank you once again for joining us for this evening's uh, uh, bible study we will be continuing with the same topic which has been started uh, by shanti last week uh, regarding the prophecy this is the second part of it and uh, so without uh, wasting any time i would like to ask shanti to lead us in the bible study but before that uh, we'll have a short prayer so can i ask pastor dan to lead us in prayer okay let's pray then loving gracious father uh it certainly is a privilege once again uh to be in your presence and connect with our loved brethren from all over india and the us we thank you father for continuing to provide for us granting us safety even as we see so many mishaps taking place but today we are here to continue to study and equip and un understand prophecy and we pray for your very special anointing on shanti as she leads us and uh, continue to uh, enrich and enlighten us father in through these subjects so that our faith in you will continue to grow we commit the study into your hands and we ask this in the name of jesus our lord amen thank you pastor dan uh, thank you praveen uh, please allow me to share my screen are you able to see my screen and hear me loud and clear okay that's wonderful all right so uh, let's uh, begin uh, and I'm so glad to see you guys all back again for part two study of understanding prophecy. So I would like to begin with the summary of part one that we have learned and studied last week. So these were the objectives that we have cleared in part one. And uh, I hope you remember the story that, uh, that I shared about the frog and the boy and uh, where we concluded that no one explanation fits all the aspects of this particular gift, but with the right tools and understanding, we can safely understand this gift in the right way. And as I have said, you know, last week too, I will repeat it again and say that prophecy is a very, very fascinating topic and at the same time very challenging to understand and so so much of knowledge and maybe a bit more information than normal than usual is being given to us uh, from the bible in this part one and part two study about this topic so perhaps a few of us may have been wondering about this particular question isn't it do we need to learn so much about prophecy and is this info uh, useful to me in my daily life? The simple answer to that is yes, it's very much needed for us to learn deeply about this from the God, from the Lord's word itself. An excellent quote that I found uh, by Mr. Joseph Tikach Jr. And I found this in one of our GCI Equipper articles. And he says this, he says that Jesus taught that the purpose of scripture is to reveal God, his character, purpose, and nature. And so a Christ-centered reading of scripture helps us to stay true to that purpose, and it helps us avoid misinterpreting any messages that come our way on a day-to-day -day basis as a prophecy. So we must accept the fact, my brothers and sisters, that this gift of prophecy has been used as a blessing in the right way throughout the ages and also was misused by many who took advantage of people's interest and also because of the mystery it holds and also for their own personal gain. So even today, we keep hearing that about these new new prophecies that are being given isn't it coming from this and that self-titled prophet and this is why we need to have the more understanding that we gain with the help of the holy spirit the better we are off so that one day you and i will be able to help someone else understand what the spiritual gift of prophecy is all about and of course to be a blessing to them 
as a wise and learned person in God's word. And this is why Proverbs 18, 15 actually exhorts us and tells us that an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And so being the wise as we all are and that we are here to learn and gain knowledge, let's seek knowledge and the truth by starting our part two of the study of understanding prophecy. I will start with two major raging debates among biblical scholars in today's world. But before even we do that, I found a very uh, interesting, but a very important uh, animation cartoon slide. Okay, and I want to show that, and this is taken from uh, one of Mr. Tikar Jr.'s articles itself, but I'm willing to show it to you because it ties up very beautifully with what we are learning today. So I'm going to show you the, the cartoon slide and you let me know what do you think it is. What do you see in this picture? Uh, you can unmute yourselves and tell me. What do you see in this picture? Let's start with who is that person? Um, I think all of you are unmute. You can unmute yourself for this particular part. Prisoner? He's a prisoner. Okay, great. What is the prisoner doing? He's trying to escape, but he's going towards more, yeah. <laughs> more can switch. Okay. I think you guys got the idea right. I mean, we need to remember that digging deep does not exactly guarantee that our conclusions will be good and perfect, isn't it? As we already agreed, remember last week, that no one aspect fits everything perfectly when learning about this gift of prophecy. And so we not only learn to dig deeper, but to dig in the right direction. As it says in 2 Timothy 3.7, it is possible to be always learning but never be able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so in the pursuit of truth and knowledge, let's dive, dig in deeper and also in the right direction. And we will start with the two modern debates happening in today's time. The first one being cessationist versus continuationist. Now, don't be worried if you have not heard of this terminology before. I am here to help you, take you through and give you an idea of what this is. Now, we'll start with the first one that is cessationist. Now, this practice is called cessationism. The people who hold an ideology that spiritual gifts such as healing, prophecy and speaking in tongues have ceased with the apostolic age. They believe that these gifts are not any longer given by God to the church and uh, they might have stopped either late in the first century AD or gradually over the following centuries. That is a, this is the ideology that cessationists uh, take, uh, take root in. They do not believe that God still gives these gifts today, but they do believe that healing can still happen, though healers are no longer empowered by God. Now, this cessationism ideology is mostly associated with the Calvinistic movement and developed during the Reformation. Uh, two very famous cessationists that we know of in the world today are uh, John Stott and John MacArthur, a very well-known American author. Let's move on now to the continuationist, and that practice is called as continuationism. Now, continuationism is exact opposite of cessationism, and it is the Christian belief that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have continued to the present age and are given according to the Lord's will and purpose of God. Now, this ideology of continuationism is mostly associated with the Lutherans, with the Methodists, the Reformed, and the Pentecostal movement. For example, if we were to look at two very famous continuationists, we can say John Piper, the famous author and pastor, and Wayne Gruden, a professor of theology and biblical studies at the Phoenix Seminary in Arizona. So, 
I don't know where do we stand, whether we go and uh, you know prefer being a cessationist or a continuation. That's something that we need to ask. But before you delve into that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we should note revelatory elements in what John the Baptist said concerning Jesus in Matthew 3, 1 to 12. Uh, as I have indicated last week, I have put certain scriptures as references and uh, some of them have been opened for you to read along. Uh, nevertheless, I highly recommend that you take these um, uh, notes down or the references down or simply go back to the link that Pastor Praveen will put up in another two days for the YouTube of the study so that you may delve deeper by your own uh, with the help of the Lord. Another revelatory uh, note that we can see is when Simeon, you know, he was not counted as a priest or a prophet, but he was counted as somebody righteous. You know, Simeon was told by the Holy Spirit that he will not die until he sees the face of the Messiah. And he prophecies concerning Jesus. Another revelatory element we can note with another prophetess when she was praying for the coming of the messiah in the temple and when she sees baby jesus she spoke about him prophetically another example that i would like to give as a revelatory element that people had was the samaritan woman at the well if you if you remember the story the Samaritan woman discerned very rightly that Jesus was a prophet in the way that Jesus spoke with clarity and authority. Now, she was not a prophet, but I'm sure the Holy Spirit revealed that to her. And so when cessationists, the people who believe that no longer these gifts are given anymore, they will say that all of these revelatory elements were seen before the church age. They will say, this is the proof. Huh? So we are right. And uh, so these are all seen before the Day of Pentecost. But this gift has been very much seen even after the day of Pentecost and even in church age. For example, Agabus, the prophet in Judea in Acts 11, chapter 27, uh, verses 27 to 28, prophecies about a great famine that was coming on the entire Roman world. And this was later on fulfilled during the reign of Claudius, the Roman emperor. Again, in Acts 21, verses 10 to 11, Agabus prophecies that the Jew at, uh, Jews at Jerusalem would bind Paul and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. But this was a prediction that was nearly correct, but not quiet. The Romans and not the Jews bound Paul. And this is why we say that we have to, uh, you know, test and validate every prophecy that's given because here Agabus gives a partially right prophecy. And we will come back to this particular part a little later. But we can also note in Acts chapter 15 verses 32 that Judas and Silas were noted as prophets and they said many things to give strength and prophesied about hope to the believers. In Acts 13, one, the very famous verse, we hear and read that the church in Antioch had many, many prophets and teachers. And so clearly we can see that even in the church age, this gift was being operated upon. So this is the first modern debate that the world has today, cessationism versus continuationism. Now, the second debate that the modern world has today is that some of the biblical scholars hold the theology that gift of prophecy and the gift of speaking in tongues in the New Testament or in the church age is a confirmation of the reception of the Holy Spirit, they say. But this statement exactly doesn't hold water because it is written very clearly in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, that all gifts are produced by one and the same spirit. And so the spirit distributes gifts to each person just as he would determine. Neither can you nor me influence the Holy Spirit to give us a certain gift or give someone else a certain gift. So any of the spiritual gifts can be noted as a confirmation of the reception of the Holy Spirit as discerned by one own self or by others. Also, Prophecy is one of the nine gifting spiritual gifts that are listed in these scriptural references. And many more references are given in the New Testament where we see regarding prophets and 
prophecies maintaining a line of continuity from Old Testament and to the New Testament across the entire word of God, even today. And so God continues to speak to us today, whether it is by prophecies, whether it is by forth telling prophecies or by foretelling prophecies, the Lord continues to speak with us. But we must note that there will be a day when prophecy will cease and that will be the day when Jesus will return to establish his throne firmly in his kingdom. As it says in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 8 to 10, that whatever went, whatever was preached in, in, in part, everything will disappear and only completeness will be there when Jesus arrives and establishes his throne firmly here on earth. And so we quickly we will move on to these are this is the second modern debate that the world is right now uh, you know uh, taking part in. But nevertheless, let's quickly uh, move into the purpose of prophecy. Before we even get into it, the first point of the purpose of prophecy is its threefold ministry, as we see through First Corinthians fourteen verses. 3 to 5. Uh, it is written here that a person who prophecy speaks to people to make people stronger, to give them hope and to comfort them, to build up the church. And Paul himself exhorts that he would like us to speak in many tongues, yes, but he would rather have us prophesying. So if I was to sum up this entire verse into colloquial English, where you and I can understand the threefold ministry uh, in the first point of purpose of the prophecy is, can be noted as such. The first being edification and spiritual advancement of the reader or of the listener of the prophecy. Second would be exhortation and encouragement. And third, of course, comfort and consolation. This is the threefold ministry of prophecy. Okay. The second purpose of prophecy is because it's at the foundation of church itself, as noted in Ephesians 2 uh, verse 20. It says that you are a building, that you is you and me, the body of Christ that is being built on apostles and prophets because they are the foundation. And Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone of this body of Christ. And so we can safely say prophecies are given, are sent to rebuke and warn us with a call to repentance. It also gives us hope and it is given for the Lord's glory. Prophecies bring a conviction to move us to a revival and restoration. And as we have already said before, Acts 13, 1 to 2, it prophecy also gives us guidance. And we read the story of Paul and Barnabas where they were guided by the Holy Spirit to no longer go into the Jewish towns, but to go where the Gentiles are to share the gospel. And the third purpose of prophecy is never to cause a past panic or a chaos or create mayhem. Now, this particular point, we will come back again. Please note it down, though, that the prophecy's purpose is never to cause a panic, a chaos or mayhem. So the million dollar question we are all waiting for is this, isn't it? How do you and me know which prophecy is true or not in the present days? And how do we interpret it rightly? So every prophecy has a need for validation or a confirmation in today's time, even if it's spoken in God's name. Every prophecy has a need for validation or confirmation in today's time, even if it is spoken in God's name. This is where you and I are called to be using our wisdom and discernment that the Lord has given Christians are to test every prophecy that we hear today as we have been warned and told in the scriptures. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22, the word says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. 1 John 4, 1 says, do not believe every spirit but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. And so it is very important that we test and validate every prophecy, even if it is spoken in God's name. So how do we test? 
and what do we look out for in a interpretation, the right interpretation of a prophecy. Let's look at this from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. The first point, how we can test is to consult God's instruction. That means consult and look through from the point of the scriptures, from the uh, line of scriptures. So if any prophecy is given by anyone, be it pastors, be it apostles, reverends, prophets, these days there are many titles to keep a track. But no matter whoever gives us any prophecy, we need to consult the, uh, the Lord's scriptures. And we need to be aware of these three factors. Beware if a prophecy doesn't align with the context of the word of God. Secondly, beware if it compromises with what is written in the scripture. Thirdly, we need to be aware if it is in direct contradiction with the scripture themselves and or with the character and the very nature of God, then definitely we can see that a prophecy is not from God. And so we can disregard it with confidence. Now we on this side of the cross are in a much better time because now we have scriptures to check and verify. But in the olden times, they didn't have that. But even in the Old Testament time, we have, uh, God has given scriptures to the people at that time through Deuteronomy 18 verses 18 to 22. The Lord himself says, I will rise up a prophet. I will put my words in his mouth to tell him, to tell the people what I have commanded. And the Lord goes down a few more verses and he says in verse 21, you may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet claims in the name of the Lord does not take place, or come true, then that is a message the Lord has not spoken. So not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, in this particular age too, we need to watch out. So even as we look at whether the prophecy is in direct contradiction or is it compromising, is it compromising of being, is not aligning with the nature of God or the character of the Lord, we should remember never to disrespect the person who brings that prophecy or judge them in any way, because we are to show God's love. Because we ought to show God's love. And at no point, we need to accept the prophecy once we validate it and we see that it is not right. But do not hate the person, but hate the sin or the mistake that they have done, which as humans, we all inherently do. Because none of us are perfect and we do not want to judge or disrespect anyone because we do not want to be in direct disobedience of what the Lord commands to love your neighbor as our self. Also remember that our God is a God of order. Everything from him and through him always brings order and edification and not the other way around. And this is why I said a prophecy from the Lord never creates chaos or mayhem or panic, but it always leads to edification according to his purposes and plans. If I was to sum up this first uh, point of how we test using or consulting God's instruction, all these sub points I can quote into one of our GCI articles quotation and Think of it maybe as a toolbox for yourself uh, to use whenever you want to interrupt or rather interpret a given prophecy. And of course, with the help of uh, the Holy Spirit's guidance. The article says that we have to use an understandable method of interpretation. One that makes sense historically. That means we have to take into consideration the prophecy that is given, which which country was it given? What is the time that it was given? Linguistically, that means what is the language that is being used? Now we know that every language is different. Our nuances, the way we form our sentences are very different from one another, right? And of course, it should align theologically with the scriptures. For example, if suppose there's a French guy speaking Fr French in Paris, his construction of sentences would be very different from you and me if we have learned French and uh, and uh, spoke here in India, isn't it? Our words will be different. The way we use our grammar will be different. And a paragraph flow will be different, isn't it? Because it comes from the 
background from which we are speaking. And so we must be taking into consideration of all of this when you want to interpret a uh, prophecy in the right way. Also, we must consider the type of literature. We learned about it, remember, autobiographical, was it, whether it is biographical, or is it a sermon that we're dealing with? And of course, the overall message of the Bible it speaks about God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you and for me because he loved us so much. The second way that we can test uh, a prophecy and look out for in interpreting it is by checking the gift fruits of the prophet, the sources of the prophet and the purpose of that prophecy which is given. Now many of the present day prophets you will see they will hardly speak about God. Maybe they will start off saying the Lord gave me this to tell you but very soon they will go and divulge into I have been there, I have predicted this and that came true. I have gone here, I have done this and it came became right. They will only speak about themselves and not about the Lord. So we can check the fruits of the prophet and see if they glorify God or do those fruits glorify the prophet himself. And so that is also one way of testing or validating a prophecy. Also, we need to remember to check for the timing of these so-called prophecies or the times a certain person will claim to be a prophet will emerge. Like, are they coming only when there are some important or public events happening? Or maybe at the start of a new year, only we see them and we don't see them in the remainder of the year. For example, I want to give an example of a certain someone who called themselves a prophet. And he predicted that Trump would win the 2016 US elections. And because Trump won that year, people thronged to, to this person's church. And again, because of the popularity that he had, that person predicted again that 2020 will be again the year of Trump and that God was behind Trump and he will win the election. And very interestingly, the same prophet, we did not see him uh, prophesy anything between 2016 to 2020. That's an interesting one, isn't it? And so suddenly in 2020, we saw that Biden won the election and not Trump. And so people were dejected and faded from the, uh, from the, from the attention of the uh, prophet, the so-called prophet. And so uh, we see here very clearly that um, all these glaring warning signs that we have been talking about, isn't it? The glory was not to the Lord, it was to the prophet. And the motivation and the intention of the prophet also was not right. And so this way we can see and validate a prophecy and the prophet, okay? Whether they call themselves prophets or apostles, whether they say that they've heard from the Lord, we have a toolbox to see and validate. Just as it's written in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 14 to 15, it says, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of the light. And so it is not surprising that the, his servants will also masquerade as servants of righteousness. And so any prophet's ultimate goal is to glorify God. Any prophecy that does not bring focus back to Lord and, and it takes away the focus from the Lord, and takes it to something else or anyone else is also an excellent indication in how to test or validate whether a certain prophecy is from God or not and, and what how we can interpret it in the right way. And so we must know not to follow any of these self-appointed men or women because that is definitely a detriment to our spiritual growth. And third uh, way to test and validate a prophecy and uh, to look out for an interpretation is we need to check if any prophecy produces liberty or bondage. Now Jesus has set you and me free and so in no way we need to be following anything that will bind us again or make us a slave to anything but to our savior and redeemer. For example, if people will come and prophesy that you must invest this much amount of money here or there, we need to put on the cap of discernment of the Lord and see five steps ahead and see if we are going into a bondage of debt or not. Because Lord's given prophecies 
always produces liberty and never the uh, bondage. So we as believers need to stop being gullible. You know, Asani se dhoka kha lete hain hum log hai na? Bhola pana. Christians, we, we say Christians should be innocent. Bhola. But the Lord very clearly says we need to have discernment and wisdom at any given point of time. And so remember we talked about that if any prophecy goes against the very character and nature of God or will compromise or contradict the scriptures itself to whether to cause harm to oneself or to others, we need to be very wary. And it is a clear sign that that prophecy that is given is not from the Lord. Lastly, how can we test is we will need to use the knowledge that we learn from the word of God because it is a double-edged sword and that will cut through anything. It will judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, the word says. And so we must know the knowledge of God, his scriptures to be embedded in, onto our tongue, into our tips, so that we can also counter like Jesus did after his 40 days of fasting in the wilderness when he countered Satan with the very word of God. And so we must also have the Lord's uh, instructions on our tips and tongues so that we know how we can keep or how we can bring his word into application. Again, taking into consideration linguistically, theoretically, theologically, uh, historically, making use of the grammar, the context and everything. So I'm going to put this slide up again. Uh, it's a kind of a summary slide on how to test and what do we look for in interpretation? Consult God's instruction. See if anything compromises or contradicts with what is written. Don't disrespect the person and judge them. And we have to use this toolbox that has been given to us here. And we have to check for the fruits of the prophet and their sources and purpose. We need to also check if any prophecy produces liberty or bondage. And lastly, we need to use the knowledge that we learn from the word of God and put it into application whenever we come across anybody saying that they have a prophecy for us. I want to uh, take a little more time here and give you an example of certain things that I have come across uh, even as this how do we test summary is a slide is placed before us on, a, on the screen because I, I believe that we need to be very aware and uh, uh, aware and cautious as the citizens of this world today. Now, of late, we hear of many self-titled prophets in South India and North India. And I'm sure that these kind of people are all around the world. Now, I don't want to mention their names, but they have large followers, number of followers. And uh, I've heard from a few acquaintances who were in some of these churches that the prophets, so-called prophets from the pulpits, call out and say, anybody whose names start with uh, these these uh, alphabets and I, we all know right there are some alphabets which have the most number of Indian names and so very wisely they pick these two three uh, alphabets and they say people who are uh, whose names are starting with this alphabet please stand up get ready make your passports ready because you are going to go abroad and people have conned people this way and so these poor people who hear about this they are running pillar to post to get their passports ready. I mean, there's nothing wrong in getting a passport ready because it's our identity. But nevertheless, for doing it for the wrong purposes and to get a visa for a certain nation, you ought to show a certain amount of bank balance, isn't it? So they're, they're selling off the possessions and the selling of all that they have and they're making wrong choices by believing in these false prophets. And they tell us that many times they were disappointed, but the hope that they have, they say, is they hang on into that church or to that particular self-titled prophet, thinking that one day their name will be called and maybe perhaps one day it will be their chance. And so we never should be gullible, but we should be as wise followers of Jesus. Also, there are false prophets in the continent of Africa, and we have encountered some of them while we were in Kenya. 
they're very intelligently using this very gift of prophecy to con people. Now, they generally start off by using the broad generalized version. They're very smart and they do not give you specific to anyone, uh, any one person uh, prophecy because they know that they could be in trouble or it could be verified. And so they say that Africa is going to become one big nation like the United States of America. It will also be soon called as uh, United Nation of Africa. And they even quote Ezekiel 37, 15 to 22, where it talks about having one nation. And so nobody questions them back because again, they are told you are of weaker faith. And so uh, we must be aware that these are the cons that people are doing using this particular gift from the Lord. Also, recently, I've heard of another brother in Christ whose story I got to know and whose wife was ailing of cancer. And the whole family was in need of genuinely prayers and support. And a pastor one day walked in into their home and with all the pomp and the right words proclaimed and prophesied that she was healed. Now, unfortunately, a week after the wife passed away, bringing much grief and perhaps disappointment too in the family's life after such a powerful prophecy being spoken. I'm sure they must have been shaken in their faith too. And this is why we need to validate every spoken prophecy. People will come and say to us, I have a prophecy for you. The spirit told me to tell you. Do remember that not to reject them directly as we are learning now, we must test and validate every prophecy or revelation that comes our way. Now, those of us, who have been reformed from our WCG times are very much aware of the danger of what happens when we interpret and live out a certain revelation or a prophecy from the Bible in a wrong way. I'm sure the leaders at that time, they had the right motive to earnestly follow the Lord. But many people from our old times, including my dad, and uh, you know, they left their jobs, doctors gave up their professions, people sold off their lands due to a past WCG teaching and wrong interpretation of the Bible, thinking the second coming of the Lord is very near. But many families suffered due to this when they were left reeling under the aftermath with no financial stability or security, with no means to look after the family that the Lord himself gave. So many families, in fact, broke off. And many families that I personally know who were in WCG are still dealing with some of these so-called prophecy aftermaths. And I'm so glad that now we are GCI and we are reformed and we know better. But that particular time, if that particular interpretation, wrong interpretation, has caused irreparable damage for some families, making them permanent captives of the fear of the future itself. And so even as we learn how to test and uh, what to look for in interpreting a given prophecy, we have to note certain things that uh, there are conditional prophecies noted in the scriptures and also widely being used by the so-called prophets. Now, if you remember Jonah in Jonah 3, 4, he finally reached Nineveh and he prophesied for 40 days. He said, repent and you, or you shall be destroyed. But when the people of Nineveh repented, God changed his plans. He forgave them and he saved their lives. So here we can see that, uh, you know, a prophecy given was a conditional one. There was repent or else. But thankfully, we see here that Jonah's prophecy led to repentance. And that is what we spoke about earlier, isn't it? About the prophecy, the purpose of a prophecy as intended by God is to bring about a conviction, a change of heart, which leads towards a restoration. Another example of a conditional prophecy, which was not at all conditional in the uttering of of it was uh, is noted in Second Kings chapter twenty when King Hezekiah was sick and his immediate death was positively announced throughout the nation. But prayer and tears added fifteen years to his life. However, even as we learn of conditional prophecies noted within the scriptures, we also need to be aware that many of the false prophets also operate under conditional prophecies and they will very smartly task us to do something for the prophecy that they have given to work. 
and that will not be for God's glory. These false prophets also sometimes they try and they will manipulate people to act in a certain way to control them. As we see cult leaders, right, all around the world, in India too, we see some of these cult leaders using prophecy as a means for making their followers act in a certain way so that they are better controlled. And so sometimes we see, uh, you know, sometimes these so-called self-titled prophets, they will analyze what is our circumstance. They will see what our need is and then they will assess and they will come up with a prophecy that is completely their own. And so we need to be cautious. These are like those sheep, uh, those uh, particular shepherds who will eat their own sheep, you know, as it's written in Ezekiel 34 verse 10. And that is why, brothers and sisters, we need to pray for discernment over our churches, over the body of Christ, over each of our brothers and sisters, not only that the Lord will protect them, but also that we will become wiser and not gullible to the tricks of the devil. Now, a natural and a fair question when learning about conditional prophecies is, does the presence of a conditional element destroy the value of a prophecy? The answer to this actually depends on what the true value and intent of the prophecy is as given by the Lord, not as given by a man. Remember Jonah preached, right, with great earnestness in Jonah 3, 4. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, he said. He put a lot of great stress on the exact fulfillment of the prediction. And when the prophecy did not get fulfilled, Jonah let his feelings take over and he became angry with God. And he did not consider the true value and intent of the God-given message to the people of Nineveh. Now, you and me we can also fall into the same error as modern interpreters of a prophecy if we do not check ourselves. We have to have a deeper spiritual insight into the Lord's character and nature. And we really need to, again, we come, come back to that 360 degrees. We need to know the Lord's word in a much deeper way and his love for humanity deeply with his scriptures embedded in our hearts so that we can put it into application and and use it and be wise. Now, some uh, in in I'm nearing my, the conclusion of my part two study, but I want to leave you guys with some pointers. The first prof, uh, pointer would be that prophecy was not inspired to satisfy our curiosity about the future. It has always had a theological purpose from God. Prophecy was not inspired. To, in, to satisfy our curiosity needs about the future, but have always had a theological purpose about it. It tells us something about what God is doing with humanity. And it is given to help motivate people to do something in the present. And that is what it remains even to this day and age. It is very different from trying to discover in what age the end may arrive or what specifically might happen in the world at any given point of time. Matthew 24, 6 to 13, Jesus himself says, you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. You will have diseases, disasters, famines, but those are just the beginning of problems but these things will happen yes but the end is still to come and so when we come across people who give predictions and prophecies who say the end is at the near we must re reflect what happened before that there have been many people who have been predicting it in the wrong way so we must not be alarmed we just need to persevere and do the job that is set before you and me as a follower of Christ the second pointer I want to give you is that the future should be safely left to the care of God. As he himself says through Jeremiah 18, 7 to 10, he says it is under his purview when to rise up a nation, when to bring a nation down. But that will be from because of the consequences of their actions. It is not for you and for me to interpret something about a certain nation, something that is happening in that particular nation. And so anything that we see going here and there, it is not left for us to interpret it. There is, There are people that God has assigned 
who can read and who can, with the discernment of the, of the Holy Spirit, they can interpret these for us. And so the another point that I would want to give you guys is that prophecy is a spiritual gift given to us so that we may be edified in the present, so that we are still aligned with the will of God and we are secured in our future by running the race that is faithfully marked before us. And so in being edified, in being aligned with the will of God in the present time, he is the one who secures our future. But sometimes as Christians, we do get swayed, don't we? Because speculative prophecy is much more exciting than the gospel itself. What does the gospel say? The gospel says, trust in me, lean on me, lean not onto your own understanding. The gospel says, give your burden. I put it on to me because my yoke is lighter. The gospel says, be still and know that I am God. The gospel says, seek knowledge, these kind of things. And so for us as humans, sometimes things or the fruit that is forbidden or the fruit that is beyond our reach is more uh, exciting sometimes that we can interpret and add anything. For example, you know, take a numeral, uh, a number and attach some significance to it. And if we have followers, it is even more exciting, isn't it? And so we must never fall prey to those kind of things. We must understand always that Bible prophecy reveals God. It reveals his will. And it reveals the purpose of purpose for humanity according to the intent of the Lord. And so you and me need not discern when the end will come. We need to leave that future in God's hand as it has been given in these scriptures. One of our elders from GCI, Mr. Mike Morrison, puts it the best. He says, as Christians, our job is to watch our own spiritual attitudes to be sure that we are in a relationship of faithful love with our creator. We have no need to watch at every world event in that sense. God is sovereign and he will take care of his own plans. And in the resurrection of the dead to the eternal life, all God's people will share the ultimate victory that has been won by Jesus Christ. And so we must ensure that we are aligned with the will of God in the, uh, in the present so that the Lord will secure our future. In conclusion, the office of a prophet or a prophetess is honorable in God's sight. The Lord has appointed and he does give gifts, uh, even though we see quite less in of late because, um, uh, because of several other reasons. But nevertheless, it is honorable in God's sight. Whoever is called to this particular gifting needs to practice and display courage to step up and to do whatever God asks of us boldly, with diligence and selflessness. Also, while operating this gift, we must ensure that we are filled with love. Because God is love. Remember, no prophecy needs to go against the very character and the nature of the Lord. And so, love is indispensable while operating this gift. Also, in conclusion, we must know that Jesus, being our ultimate prophet, has revealed all that there is to be revealed to us and also to that degree which we should know things. Now, again, it is forbidden fruit, isn't it? It's more exciting to know what is not yet revealed, isn't it? But Jesus has revealed thus far to us. And for the unrevealed, he says in Acts chapter 1, 7, that the seasons and the times are not for us to know. Now, they are still under the authority of our Almighty Father. So it is good to remember that the purpose of Bible prophecy is not to help us predict the future, but to help us know Jesus, the Lord of all history. And so, yes, we need to be aware of certain things that the Lord has mentioned in the scripture that are going to come. But we need not worry because our purpose is to run the race that is faithfully marked for us. And so prophecy prepares the way for Jesus and points to him alone. I want to leave you with an encouragement that Paul himself gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1. He says, eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy, so that you and I may build up the nation, build up the body of 
Christ. And so I conclude with uh, the part two objectives. And uh, we have seen the two modern day debates uh, between cessationists and uh, continuationists, and also whether uh, speaking in tongues and prophecy is a confirmation of the reception of the Holy Spirit. We talked about what is the purpose of prophecy in our times, uh, about the threefold ministry of, uh, of the uh, of prophecy. We have talked about how to validate a certain prophet or a prophecy in our times, how to test and how to interpret. You know, how do we, what are the tools that we use when we want to interpret a given um, uh, prophecy in the right way. And so we conclude. I hope this um, uh, this uh, study has been very edifying for you as it has been for me. And uh, I would like to open this time now for added comments and uh, added um, uh, questions and answers if you have. Uh, but I would like to first start with the question that Mr. Nagar asked last week. Uh, uh, Mr. Naga, I hope uh, you remember the question that you asked. You said, is every detail in a prophecy about Jesus only? Do you remember this question? So I wanted to let you know that Jesus began with the book of Moses. And they have some messianic prophecies in them. But most of the Pentateuch is about Jesus in a different way. Whether in time, it is in different in terms of typology, that means classification based on types or categories. It is also in the rituals of sacrifice and priesthood that prefigured the work of the Messiah. And Jesus explained these concepts too. But some prophecies were given to fulfill God's prophecy uh, purpose then and at that time of history. So while some of them led towards Jesus, we cannot reconnect the dot. We cannot connect the dots directly that, and say that all the roads, events of past and present, uh, you know, everything will be about Jesus. But they will eventually lead to Jesus. Now, if you want the scriptural uh, reference in Luke twenty four forty four, Luke tells us that uh, he said, "This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. What is written about me." In the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Now, again, here we see that he did not say that every single detail was about Jesus. What he said was that the parts that were about him had to be fulfilled. Now, we could add that not everything had to be fulfilled in the first coming. And some, so some prophecies seem to point to the future, to the time of Jesus' return. And like he said, they must be fulfilled. Not just prophecy pointed to him, I'd like you to note. The law also pointed to him. The Psalms also pointed to him. And the work he would do for our salvation also pointed to him. So Jesus is the main prophecy, main focus of prophecy. So it is safer to be focused on that rather than get into all these speculations. I hope I have answered your query. And this has been taken, a few, uh, some of this has been taken straight away from one of our uh, GCI articles, and I found that very helpful while uh, trying to answer your question. I'll stop my screen share uh, and uh, and I'll take your comments and question and answers if you have. Yes. Mr. Nagar, I'm not able to hear your voice uh, clearly. Uh, sorry. Can you repeat that, please? I said yes, the presentation from the future time. Can you hear me? She can't hear me. Okay, now we can hear Now you. it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I will say congratulate you for your brilliant pre presentation. It was very well done, very informative. And uh, yes, there will be some questions, of course. But uh, basically, uh, yeah, congratulations really for a good yes, job. For his glory. Thank you so much for that comment. And one more thing, <clears throat> the, the modern day prophecies, as you gave examples of, you know, like 
Trump will win in such and such year, or <clears throat> you will be healed, or things like that. Are these really prophecies? They are not really, <clears throat> as you said, prophecies have to be God-centered and pointing towards his purpose. Now, these things are not, uh, according to me, these are not prophetic statements. These are, uh, you know, <laughs> just uh, uh, people guessing or people just making a fool of others and uh, uh, <clears throat> divination or whatever you call it. These are really not prophecies. And actually, the real prophecies, whatever the Bible has already concluded and everything is in there. You know, the, the most common of prophecies is people did, uh, predict the time of Jesus is coming, time of the end and so on, which, you know, Jesus himself says, nobody knows the time and uh, day when Jesus will come and the end time and so on. As you rightly said, we just need to do our part and forget the, leave the future to God. So that's one of the comments I wanted to make. <clears throat> That is so true, uh, Mr. Nagar. What you said is absolutely the truth. And we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as you said. <laughs> I would like to share one experience. Uh, it is from the time when I was uh, growing in my faith, right? Um, and that time, we were in Middle East and we used to have this guest speaker who would come to Middle East. They used to call him Prophet some name. And then many of us, many of different churches would go and fill his, um, he used to come for three, four days and we used to fill his, this thing. He had a very strong word. Uh, and then everybody used to wait after the service because that is when he will, um, put his hand over us and pray and probably reveal the will of God. Okay. Reveal the will of God. And, uh, and then people used to so much wait to see what is God's word for me that this prophet is going to reveal. And, and at that time is to expect, are, is he going to say something to me or going to happen to me or how I'm going to turn out to be? And if that happens without, he just prayed this, that you say, oh my goodness, I lost the, I mean, I don't know what's the will of God for me. But then as I grew, I realized that sometime often our fear, our own identity, uh, when that is misled, misled, that is not we where it is, then I think we keep searching for it in other places. And unfortunately, other people take the advantage of that. Like this uh, example, what Shanti was sharing about this famous pastor is to say, okay, those names starting with S, J, K are going to Dubai. And I when people would get so excited. And then I realized that he is taking uh, advantage of their hope, which they are clinging on to it. And I, hence, if it is nicely, properly turned, focus put on back to God, I think a lot of this need would just vanish and we would no more reach other people to know what is God's will. We'll directly reach out to God to know His will for us. Right, right. Also, maybe I should add this. You know, if suppose the Lord today told you and me, each one of us in these windows here now, told us everything that is to come, like He did with uh, you know John. Do you think you and I would have been the way we are right now? It would have been very difficult, isn't it? We wouldn't have been able to concentrate on the present itself if the Lord would have told everything concerning the future and so I think it is in the Lord's intent and because he loves us so much he has chosen to only reveal to that extent which he thinks that we are able to take it and use it for our present so that our uh, uh, our future is secured with him absolutely I just wanted to comment on what Anil said, uh, that these people who supposedly prophesy are not prophecies. And it reminded me of a, a scripture in Jeremiah. I'll read it for you. It says, Jeremiah 23 and verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, 
not from the mouth of the Lord. <laughs> so, so I thought that was uh, uh, so apt <laughs> that they are uh, gassing away right, yeah. from their own uh, you know, thoughts. Any other comments? Yes, sir, Miss yeah, they're more common, but it is up to us to be more discerning, you know, and not, but, you know, sometimes people are going through such uh, hardships. hardships and some very difficult time that they want to cling to something. And this mm -hmm. this is what probably uh, then uh, messes things up. False hopes. Uh, before we end, I, I just wanted to make a comment on what Bertram uh, said last week. Bertie, if you remember, you mentioned about the era of the church, whether we are in Laodicean era. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, clarify something which I think uh, many people uh, sometimes make a mistake of in the sense that even we did in the past. The churches mentioned in the book of Revelation 2 and 3 uh, were actual churches, you know, in the Asia Minor region. And uh, sometimes um, we tend to think that the letters written to them were prophetic and that it was supposedly prophesying different eras of the church. And uh, I think we have come to understand that may not be what was intended by John. And I just want to read from... Uh, one of our articles where it says the letters written to the seven churches that existed at a particular time in history. These are letters, not prophetic prophecies of the future. Uh, so in other words, there are no errors of the church. You know, I mean, they were not supposedly errors of the church. They are uh, churches that had certain spiritual conditions that needed to be highlighted and that's why they uh, the, the letters were written to them but it has a prophetic note in it for all churches through the ages if i can just read uh, one more uh, section here it says each letter concludes with the same statement he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches the word here is churches, plural. This implies that the words written to each congregation are meant to apply to all seven churches. This means that the seven individual church message were meant for all the congregations in Asia of John's day and by extension for the entire church of all time. So we can infer that the spiritual condition of these seven congregation is characteristics of every group of Christians, you know, for the last 2000 years. So God's people in all ages should be concerned about the spiritual problems described in each of the letters and take assurance in the promise that the, that the overcomers will inherit all things with their savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I just thought I'll just make that mention, Bertie, I hope it's uh, it clarifies maybe me your comments that you made. Yeah, thank you, Mr. T uh, Mr. Zachary. Thanks. <laughs> right. Thank you. Sure. Also, just to uh, add a bit on what uh, Pastor Dan has said, as we were doing the course of biblical interpretation, our um, our teacher, uh, Dr. Mike Morrison, who Shanti has referred. He said, imagine Elder John writing the whole book of Revelation and telling his readers, this will happen sometime 4,000 years later, so it has nothing to do with you. And it was written when the aftermath of the, the destruction of the temple and Nero was causing in havoc, they needed a hope. And so as uh, Pastor Dana said, it can be prophetic in nature. So it's also highlight what's going to happen later, end of the time. But it also had to make sense to the readers then and there. So we cannot take out that context and straight away take it to some time later, thinking it is it was not relevant to them and there. And largely, the book of Isaiah also had, whenever there was a prophetic uh, thing talking about Jesus, 
it was also had a reference that were fulfilled within the days of Isaiah, as well as reference that were clearly pointing how Jesus would fulfill it. Just addition. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point, uh, Sachin. Thank you. Any other comments that you'd like to add or maybe perhaps something new that you picked up and edified yourself uh, through the study of uh, the part two or in general or in uh, the study of prophecy? Mr. Poppins, you there? Usually, Mr. Poppins gives us very nice Can you hear insights. me? Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, Mr. Frank Franklin. How are uh, you? Uh, yeah, thank you. It's a heavy subject, madam. But uh, well done. You have done an excellent job. Uh, thank you so much. We, we praise God. Thank you for the encouragement. Yes, Shanti. I thought you were adding a comment. <laughs> Uh, Pastor uh, Praveen, would you like to add something to this? There's not much uh, that can be added and um, uh, regarding um, uh, there are some pointers maybe I uh, would like to add uh, when we talk about prophecy. Uh, we have to interpret prophecy in uh, under the. I feel we can draw a square under the inside this square only. Number one, the prophecy is always. Uh, it is not about an individual. The pro biblical prophecy or the prophecy that God gives us through the prophet are not for individuals. Whether to say you are going to get a job or you are not going to get a job, you will be in US or in India. That is not the prophecy. These are not for individuals. The prophecy of the Lord are for his church. And we have seen in book of Ephesians also we are reading. All things that God has done and all things that God willed are for the church, not for individuals. The entire book of Ephesians teaches that. So we have to interpret any prophecy that comes, that is collective uh, for a collective audience or for a, it is for collective people. It is not for any particular individual. And number three, we have to interpret all the prophecies that are coming today, that they have to be revealing something about God, something about what God purposed. Let me tell you what God purposed, not what God planned. Because God always purposes things. God does not do things like a plan kind of thing. Oh, I chose Adam. He is my plan. He failed. So Noah. Noah failed. So Abraham. Abraham failed. So Moses. Such kind of plans God doesn't make. He has his purpose. That is, I'm going to send my son into the world, Jesus. And whatever the story goes, however the story turns, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, his purpose is going to be fulfilled. So, in uh, in uh, this is just an example. But God's prophecies, what God reveals, are what God is purposed in Christ. And number three, what God purposed for the church through Christ. These are the four squares within which we have to interpret the prophecies. And if you go outside this, and we will get into all sorts of speculations, confusions, abuses, all things will take place. In Within this frame only, a prophecy will have its focus, that is God. A prophecy will have its purpose, that is what God is doing in the church. And it, it is having its direction, that is not for individuals, but is collectively for the church, through the church, for the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how everything is framed. And as Apostle Paul writes in Colossians, it pleased the Father that all things should consist in Christ. So whether you take prophecy or you take any other things, everything will consist in Christ where Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and church collectively is part of, included in it as his body.
Anyone else adding comments or questions? Yes, Bertie. Uh, you are uh, you are muted, Bertie. You need to unmute yourself. Oh, can you hear me, Shanti? Can you hear yes. me, Shanti? Yes, yes. Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, can I? Can I? Uh, I was just wondering. Can I be safely saying that uh, you know? Uh, regarding this uh, quite a you know very important subject of prophecy and uh, uh, how it relates to god's purposes and to be fulfilled in our lives can i safely say that i uh, hope our pastors uh, beginning with our superintendent <laughs> pastor zachariah and pastor sachin pastor praveen and even an elder mr poppins uh, can we hear from them and take it uh, be safe in accepting, you know, what they would God would be wanting us to hear as his disciple, as his people. Uh, get my get my point. What I'm trying to say is, can our leaders, um, they've been so trusting and faithful and, you know, helping us to learn and grow in the word. Can we in the future, you know, would, would I say, can I safely say that God would use these leaders to help us, help us and guide us, the membership, uh, in the subject of prophecy, Shanti? If I hear you rightly, uh, Bertie, you are saying that you would like to hear from the ordained people in the church so that they can teach you yeah. about this particular gift of prophecy. Uh, I, I am sure, yes. uh, as I said, there is forth telling prophecy. And if you believe that uh, from part one and part two that you have learned anything about uh, about this particular one then that is not shanti speaking that is the holy spirit who is speaking to you but nevertheless the pastors here are very gracious in kci our elders here are very gracious and so i'm sure that uh, they will uh, look at your request and pick up uh, you know as and when they need or if they discern that they need to be speaking about this more so I will let the pastors amongst us talk about this, about the request that you have made. Yes. Thank you, Hushan. I think Bertie meant in the future, if God reveals something, we would face, yes. we understand and be able to interpret as a servant of God and share with his people. Yes. That's what I think Bertie meant. Yes. I guess it's uh, 7.44 now. Uh, we better uh, wind up our Bible study. And once again, uh, I, would, I want to congratulate uh, Shanti on behalf of all, um, you know, pastoral team from uh, of GCI India and uh, all elders. Really, you have done a fantastic job. It was such a comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, you have uh, looked at the, I can understand how deeply you have uh, studied the subject and uh, you have seen uh, various facets of uh, the say the topic, not just one angle. You have seen from various perspectives, various angles, and uh, you have uh, <laughs> brought those forth, and uh, you have connected uh, them to uh, GCA understanding. And uh, most, um, as of now, what we can think about the most accurate uh, uh, biblical perspective towards the prophecy also, that's what I can say. Uh, it was so wonderful. Congratulations. And you have done a fantastic job. May the Lord use you uh, more frequently. <laughs> yeah, definitely more frequently. So we just, we also need a little break. <laughs> On a fun note, but definitely you have done a good job, uh, Shanti. I appreciate it. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it also. And um, so GCI, we have another teacher. So the, the her two sessions qualified her, and uh, so we are hoping to hear more in the days to come. And uh, so we'll close our uh, Bible study for this evening. Can I ask Mr. Nagar to offer a prayer? Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God in heaven, Father, we, as your servants, come to your mighty throne, giving you the praise and the glory and the thanks and the honor for everything, Lord. 
you have supplied us with all our need you have blessed us so wonderfully lord and we are really, really grateful for this precious time that we are able to spend glorifying you understanding your word a little deeper and lord trying to put into practice what you've been taught to us lord father continue to bless and inspire the <clears throat> pastors and the speakers particularly shanti did a wonderful job continue to bless her in this um, effort lord and we look forward that uh, you will inspire and and give us further messages by your chosen people lord father just let your hand of protection and care be upon us all and lord continue to guide us that we may be shining lights in the world and glorify you lord the people look at our works and glorify you so thank you lord continue to be with us as we dismiss and bring us back safely we pray and ask this all lord in jesus holy name amen, amen.